Welcome back to the channel today for another video on leadership. What I'd like to talk about today is a, is a concept that, that really baffles many, many managers as, as they try to manage through difficulties and challenges. It's a, it's a challenge called groupthink. Um, it's the challenge that comes, that arises basically when a, when a group wants to please their managers, wants to please the upper managers, or is, is stifled in a way that they don't feel the ability to surface um, issues that are coming up in the workplace. And really, to start this off, what I want to do is read you a little story written by Jerry Harvey. Uh, he was a management professor at uh, George uh, Washington University in Washington, Washington D.C. In his class, he told a story about a car trip in Abilene. So here this is here. The July afternoon in Coleman, Texas, population 5,607, was particularly hot. 104 degrees is measured by the Walgreens Rec Rexall Xlax temperature gauge. In addition, the wind was blowing fine-grained West Texas topsoil through the house. But the afternoon was still tolerable, even potentially enjoyable. There was a fan going on the back porch, and there was cold lemonade, and finally there was entertainment. Dominoes. Perfect for the conditions. The game required little more physical exertion than an occasional mumbled comment, shuffle em, and an unhurried movement of the arm to place the spots in the appropriate perspective on the table. All in all, it had the markings of an agreeable Sunday afternoon in Coleman. That is, until my father-in-law suddenly said, let's get in the car and go to Abilene and have dinner at the cafeteria. I thought, what? Go to Abilene? 53 miles? In the dust, storm, and heat? And in an unconditioned 1958 Buick? But my wife chimed, chimed in with, Sounds like a great idea. I'd like to go. How about you, Jerry? Since my own preferences were obviously out of step with the rest, I replied, Sounds good to me. And added, I just hope your mother wants to go. Of course I want to go, said my mother-in-law. I haven't been to Abilene in a long time. So into the car and off to Abilene we went. My predictions were fulfilled. The heat was brutal. We were coated with a fine layer of dust, which was cemented with perspiration by the time we arrived. The food in the cafeteria provided first-rate testimonial material for antacid commercials. Some four hours and 106 miles later, we returned to Coleman, hot and exhausted. We sat in front of the fan for a long time in silence. Then, both to be sociable and to break the silence, I said, It was a great trip, wasn't it? No one spoke. Finally, my mother-in-law said, with some irritation, Well, to tell you the truth, I really didn't enjoy it much and would have rather stayed here. I just went along because the three of you were so enthusiastic about going, I wouldn't have gone if you all had not pressured me into it. I couldn't believe it. What do you mean, you all? I said, don't put me in the you all group. I was delighted to be doing what you were doing. I didn't want to go. I only went to satisfy the rest of you. You're the culprits. My wife looked shocked. Don't call me a culprit. You and Daddy and Mama were the ones who wanted to go. I just went along to be sociable and to keep you happy. I would have been crazy to want to go out in the heat like that. Her father entered the conversation abruptly. Hell, he said. He proceeded to expand on what was already absurdly clear. Listen, I never wanted to go to Abilene. I just thought you might be bored. You visit so seldom, I wanted to be sure you enjoyed it. I would have preferred to play another game of dominoes and eat the leftovers in the icebox. 
After the outburst of recrimination, we all sat back in silence. Here we were, four reasonably sensible people who, of our own volition, had just taken a 106-mile trip across a godforsaken desert in, a, in furnace-like temperatures through a cloud-like dust storm to eat unpalatable food at a hole-in-the-wall cafeteria in Abilene when none of us really wanted to go. In fact, to be more accurate, we'd done just the opposite of what we wanted to do. The whole situation simply did not make sense. When you get into groupthink, it really doesn't make sense. Um, and a lot of researchers have gone into the subject and tried to, to understand it. And um, a man named Irving Janus basically came up with eight elements of groupthink, okay? The first was, members of the group share an illusion of invulnerability that creates excessive optimism and encourages taking abnormal risks. The second one, he said, was rationale. He said, victims of this behavior ignore the discount, discount warnings and negative feedback that may cause the group to consider their previous assumptions. So they rationalize themselves, is what that's saying. The third point, he says, is morality. Victims ignore the ethical or moral consequences of their decision and believe unquestionably in the morality of their in-group. Fourth item, members of the group possess negative and or stereotypical views of their enemies. And those might be competitors. They might be uh, issues. Um, people on the other side of the opinion uh, spectrum there. The fifth item, victims apply direct pressure to any individual who momentarily expresses concern or doubt about the group's shared views. Members are not able to express their own individual arguments against the group. The sixth item, and that's self-censorship. And this one's really, really damaging. He says, victims avoid deviating from what the group consensus is and keep quiet. Doubts and concerns about the group are not expressed. And victims of groupthink may undermine the importance of the validity of their doubts. And the seventh item, victims of groupthink share an illusion of unanimity, that the majority view and judgments of the group are unanimous. And then the eighth item says, victims of groupthink may appoint themselves to protect the group and the leaders from information that may be problematic or contradictory to the group's views, decisions, or cohesiveness. So what's happening in this last one is, there's general inability to surface bad news. So maybe a, a large project is going poorly and people in your management structure or, or group have heard some negative information, but feel like they can't pass that up, that we'll go ahead and handle it ourselves and won't pass the negative uh, impacts of the situation forward. So group think, really as a definition, is a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. So let me end here with an example of um, an identified groupthink problem. Remember the Shuttle Challenger disaster? Back in the 1980s, the Shuttle Challenger blasted off from, from the Cape and got about seven seconds into, the, uh, into their journey. And those of us who were watching on television watched it explode in the sky. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Flight 
Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Everybody wondered, well, how could such a disaster happen, killing all seven astronauts that day and them ha and the rescuers having to try to find pieces of what was once the crew cabin and the rest of the shuttle. What ended up happening really was started several months before where the there were challenges with the production of the uh, the rockets and getting everything prepared for launch. One delay after another made people edgy, made people want to make sure that they gave a, a positive decision to move forward. So during this time, the company that made the solid rocket boosters was a company named Thiokol. They were a Utah company and they had a lot of clout with a certain senator and because of that clout, they were able to get a sole source contract with the government to make the solid rocket boosters. They were the only game in town. But their monopoly was being challenged by a couple other companies that were starting to make rumblings about trying to open up the bidding process and get more, uh, more chances to move the business from Thiokol to other companies. And with this stress within the Morton Thiokol company, there became this sense of urgency to be ready to launch whenever NASA wanted to launch the next shuttle. So the solid rocket boosters were there. They were put on the, the put the rocket was assembled and the shuttle was put on the, on the launch pad and getting ready to go. But in that January, the temperature was 15 degrees lower than what it had been on any previous shuttle launch. One of the engineers who had been on, on the engineering team for several of the shuttle launches had been concerned about the O-rings. They are the rings that put together the various pieces, the various big cylinders that held in all of the rocket gases as the, as the rocket propellant was burned off and came out the, the bottom to provide the lift and the thrust going up. He had been concerned about it enough that he went to several launches with large telephoto lenses on his cameras to take pictures of how those O-rings were performing. And he had noted that on a couple launches, when the temperatures were getting a little bit lower, that he, he was seeing gases appear outside of those O-rings. In other words, gas was escaping where it shouldn't have been escaping from. Well, on this particular launch being 15 degrees lower in temperature than the rest, this engineer spoke up. After several delays, finally they decided they're going to go this time. And this engineer still spoke up and he said, we can't launch. We just don't have any data that it's safe at this temperature. NASA responded with pressure. One of those eight points is they responded with pressure. And they said, what, Thiokol, do you want us to wait till May? Basically, they were saying, are we ever going to launch? You're waiting for perfect conditions? What, what is this? Are they certified or not? And so there was all this management pressure on this engineer. And then another factor of groupthink arose. The management decided to ignore the objections of the engineer. They came up with a final vote and because the engineer was being ignored, he went into self-censorship, which is another one of those groupthink uh, traits. And by self-censoring him, they believed that they had a unanimous vote to go ahead with the launch, which ended up in disaster. Groupthink is a real function. 
I have seen it many times. I've read case study after case study where the research was done as to why the supply chain was totally fragmented or why a, an engineering project to develop a new, um, a new large assembly was getting woefully behind schedule and what it took to get it back on. And managers that I saw were fired because they couldn't get to the bottom of much groupthink, a lot of it being censorship. In other words, the not surfacing bad information when it came up. It's a real issue. There needs to be open and transparent dialogue when you're in a management group. Everybody needs to feel comfortable speaking out and everybody's opinion needs to be respected. The only way that you can avoid groupthink is to have that type of open and transparent management. That is a challenge at any level when pressure for schedule or cost becomes the driving factor of getting a project done. The people factor is why you hire good, competent experts in order to get a project done. Not listening to those experts at critical moments can cause disasters like the shuttles. I hope you liked what, what you heard today. I hope you understand a little bit better about what groupthink is all about. Please hit the subscribe button. You'll get to know when the next video comes up and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks.